And good morning, everybody. Welcome to FSU Coach Live. My name is Tim Baghurst, and today's special guest is Jen Brooks. She's an athletic director. Uh, Jen, thank you so much for joining me. If you wouldn't mind, just give us a little bit about your history and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, I am currently the athletic director at Ursuline Academy in St. Louis, Missouri. I've been at Ursuline for 28 years, and 26 of them I've been the athletic director. Wow. Uh, I was a three-sport athlete in high school and a three-sport athlete in college, um, and then found my way um, to Ursuline, and within a couple of years, I was the athletic director. So I certainly wasn't trained for this. I learned everything on the job. Um, and so that has been a unique experience, but I love it. I'm passionate about um, being here for the young women. So we're an all girls school. Mm -hmm. So I'm passionate about modeling for these young women, um, what it looks like to be a strong woman in, in this male dominated industry we call sports. Yeah, 20, 28 years in one place is pretty uncommon in sports. We don't see that very much anymore and it's becoming less and less common. What is it about your job and, and your locale that, that really encourages you to stay where you are instead of, I, I'm sure you have offers to move. Yes, uh, but I tell you what, I love the mission of this school. Uh, it's a Catholic school and I'm Catholic, so it's nice to be able to um, uh, you know, work with my faith here at school. Um, but more importantly, just being in this all girl environment um, has been something that's really just been um, special to me. And um, Reason and, and I also I live next door to, to school, so you know when you can see your kitchen window from your office window, uh, the commute's not too bad. Um, mm -hmm. You know you don't want to leave that. <laughs> when when you talk about an all girls school, it's it's fairly unique in the U.S. and we see it in other countries perhaps more. Um, what are the the maybe pros and cons of working in a a, a school like that where all of the sports are, are one gender? I would say that, you know, one of the biggest cons, well, well, let's start with the pros. Let's start with the good. The, one of the good things is that, um, you know, we're not competing for gym space with mm. um, the boys basketball team, or, you know, we're not competing with getting better uniforms. Like I get to focus all my energy and all my efforts on giving these young women the best possible of everything. Um, but the cons are, there are so many people that think girls sports are not interesting. Girls sports are boring. I mean, those words have literally been said to my face. So the challenge then is getting people to um, support and recognize and encourage these young lady in their athletic endeavors. Okay. So let me, let me push you on that one. You said your job is to encourage that. Are there any things that you actually do uh, that, that actually help in this environment? Because I mean, it's, it's not just at a, a girls only school, it's in girls sports, women's sports, where this is normal. How do you, how do you show otherwise? It's about um, creating awareness. So I'm, I'm very much about creating awareness. So any opportunity I have to showcase, to um, tell my story, to talk about, yes, women's sports are important. You should support us. We're, you know, they're, they're not any better or any worse than men's. Like they're not comparative. So stop that. So I'm very much into like redefining, reimagining, changing what it looks like to be a woman in sports. And so taking every opportunity to create awareness, I think is the first step in this space. Yeah. What are some of the challenges you've experienced as an AD? I, I mean, it can't all be wonderful. You can't love your job every day, uh, at least the minutia that comes with it. What are some of the challenges that you experience that, I mean, really anybody who wants to go into to the world of sports needs to be aware about? Well, you know, you, you're dealing with parents mm -hmm. who are demanding. And I get that. I was a parent of high school athletes back in the day, so I totally get that. Um, but it is, you know, working with those parents, getting them to understand that there's other sides to the story. Um, and then working with um, a staff of coaches who, in my case, and in a lot of cases across the country, aren't on campus. So I have a staff of over 40 coaches, and two of them are teachers in the building. So everybody else is off campus. So, you know, it's the challenge to connect with these coaches, to have meaningful conversations and time with these coaches when they're most of the day doing their full-time job. And then they come to my job after, you know, at my school after their other job. And, and, and so... 
being respectful of that. But then on top of all of that, I would say specifically for me, being a woman in this male dominated industry is probably the biggest challenge. When I go to state conferences and state meetings and national meetings and, and everything, literally I can be the only one in the room. Really? And that can be daunting. Oh yes. I mean, it happened a few weeks ago. Um, went to a state meeting and out of the 35, 40 people in the room, I literally was the only woman. Why why do you think why do you think that is? Because we're slowly seeing a change across you women's sports where more more women are becoming coaches and therefore inspiring other typically athletes transitioning into coaching. Why have we not seen that at the administrative level? Because we, you know, we're, it's it's a challenge to break into these leaders. So decisions are being made at these higher leadership levels that consist of mostly white males. Mm -hmm. And they're not willing to open the door or allow anybody else to sit there that doesn't look like them. So we have to work on that. I will tell you here in Missouri, the gentlemen at the table are doing a great job of saying, Jen, how do we get more people, more women in this space? Um, but it's created, it's, it's re reminding the men in these rooms and these spaces and at these tables that they need us, they need me, they need women at these tables in these places because our pers they need our perspective. Sure. You know, if you look at um, high school sports, if you remove football from the equation, it's a 50-50 woman and, and uh, male play sports. So we need that representation. So it's, it's just, it's an old mindset that we have to change. Hmm. Are there are there organizations out there that, that can be supportive of these initiatives that, that you are involved in or, or know of? Yes, that's funny that you ask. So, you know, for years, um, I was, you know, I felt so alone in these spaces. And I tried to create, I tried to reach out to a couple of the national organizations to ask for help, and it just didn't work. And so I created my own space. I created the Global Community of Women in High School Sports. And so this is a space for um, women and men, because we need men, we need allies, they need to hear our story, we need their support. Sometimes we need them to open doors for us. Um, but it's for athletic directors, it's for coaches, it's for athletic trainers, and anyone aspiring to be. So in this space of the global community, um, we're a support system for each other. So that when we walk into a room, um, there is a friend, maybe there is a friendly face that we can see and connect with, or we can talk to someone who's been in those spaces by themselves, and, and we can help them know how to be in that space. Um, and then just support, you know, throughout. This job is hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so to know that I have a friend who I can call in the global community is a huge thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thinking thinking of your role as an athletic director, you know, we obviously work with coaches in our program and the usual administrator of coaches is somebody like yourself. And from a coach's perspective, there can be pressure to succeed. And that succeed is usually translated into wins and losses. And yet at the same time, we, we promote this idea, at least in our programs, of, of winning isn't necessarily the wins and losses, but how you better the athlete that you work with. How do you balance that as an athletic director where you may have a, a wonderful human being as a coach, but very unsuccessful in the sport that they compete in versus a coach who may be very successful, but perhaps doesn't treat the athletes the way you would expect them to be treated. Has that ever happened? How do you deal with that? You know, correct. I, I, I for me, I hire these people. Okay, so yeah. I do. I do have a little control over who I'm bringing into my system. And for me, it's all about culture. It's creating a culture here where we are creating young women for tomorrow, and doing doing that through this thing called sports. I think winning is a byproduct of great people. So, you know, we have an emphasis here on being a great teammate. And I, so I think winning becomes a byproduct. I, I make sure that when I hire coaches that they believe in that philosophy as well. So that's important. Um, they are gonna, there are gonna be times where they get bogged down though with the wins and losses, you know, and that's where I have to come in and mentor them, have those conversations, talk about, let's step out of this game, out of this moment, let's look at the bigger picture. Um, my mantra in life is this is good. 
And so it's finding the good in everything. The good in the good is easy, but when it's hard and it's bad, let's find the good in that. So it's, you know, reframing these conversations with these coaches about, you know, um, yes, you won 10 to nothing, but what did that prove? What did that show? How did we grow and learn? Or yes, you lost 10 to nothing. Again, what can we learn from it? How can we be from it? And then really reminding them to just when they walk off the field or walk off the court to leave it there, to don't take it home. Don't let it burden you. Don't let it um, lay heavy on you uh, because that's not good for anybody. Yeah, good answer. We, you mentioned, you know, the, the hiring aspect and that, you know, you're primarily responsible for that. And at times it can be easy to, well, not easy, but we can hire somebody based on what we think they're going to be like versus what they turn out to be. How do you, how do you hire people? Do you actively recruit people? Is it through, um, the, the networking that you experience across across the state, or or do you take people based on the resume and the interview that they produce? So it's such a challenge um, at the high school level, and really I think in girls sports, you know, people it's a misnomer to think that I have hundreds or even multiple people uh, apply for a job. Uh, you know, we're often like, how do we find a coach? I, you know. Um, and so that's the challenge. So what people don't realize is I don't get to look at 30, 10, five resumes and then, you know, interview all these people and then pick the best candidate. So in some cases, I have to pick the only person who was interested in the job. Mm -hmm. And then what the challenge is then is I really have to work with them and, and mold them, massage them, mentor them into, hey, this is the philosophy. This is the mentality. This is what I need you to do. Um, and so that can be a challenge. That's not an easy thing. Um, I will say one of the things that I do here at school is I often try and plant seeds with these young ladies and say, you know what, You'll come, you're going to make a great coach one day. You should consider coaching, you know, um, just to plant the seed because there's a lot of women who think I'm not good enough or I don't know enough. And that doesn't have to be the case. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think a challenge for, for you, as you alluded to, is finding people probably in your locale because you're not hiring them full time. They don't have a, a salary per se, and therefore you're limited to the scope within your region. Uh, when, when you talked about mentoring those, those athletes to become coaches, are you seeing more, more of a, a venue for making that happen where, where these athletes can then go on to become become coaches as opposed to becoming a banker and a coach on the side, which is what most of your coaches probably are? No, you know, I, I think we're, we're, we have to do a better job of creating the, those pieces and spaces, um, you know, because gone are the days where most of your teachers were coaches. That just doesn't exist anymore. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have to find, um, we have to, I, I, it's when I get those people who have, don't have the typical nine to five job or, or don't aren't in the classroom, they, so they think they can't coach. I said, but you know, if you talk to your employer, they actually, this is a really good community service type endeavor. And so I re remind them of that. And so a lot of their employees will say, oh, this is a great thing. And you remind them, like, listen, it's really only going to be for a couple of months, unless you're talking basketball, then you're in it for more than that. But most of my seasons are three months. And so mm. hey, you, if you can do this for three months, think of the, you know, the good it'll bring everybody. Um, and so we've, so that's just something I've worked with. I do, I will say um, that I really try to pull from alums. So, you know, girls who have graduated from here because they know what we're about. So that makes it a little bit easier when it comes to the mentoring piece. They know the philosophy, they know the program. Um, now they just need to learn maybe how to coach a little bit better. From time to time, maybe more often than time to time, unfortunately, we see a coach in the news for the wrong reasons. And, and that that is not exclusive to professional sports or college sports. It happens in high school, too. One of my concerns is that coaches aren't necessarily educated enough. And they're not, a lot of times they do things not necessarily with intent, but but perhaps ignorance. How do you how do you support those coaches recognizing they're part time? They're not on campus all the time. How do you support them to to keep getting better? 
I'll tell you, it's probably one of the biggest challenges I face is that balancing process of knowing that this is a part-time job for them. They're not getting paid much. So I don't want to take up too much of their time, but I also need to get some important messages to them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so for me, it's, I have to go to meet them where they are. So if that means I have to go to their work and bring them a cup of coffee, or if I have to go to the field or the court and, and chat with them for a few minutes while the kids are stretching, that's what I have to do. I can't expect that they'll come to me. I have to go out to them. Um, and it's just finding teachable moments. It's not having these really long conversations, but it's observing something and then making a comment on it, making that a teachable moment, just like we do with our kids and then moving on. So it's not like I'm gonna have a weekly staff meeting or anything like that. I'm gonna meet them in their own place and, and create these teachable moments. Over, I was just reading a, an article this morning about how athlete stress and burnout has increased over the past two decades. And it hasn't been because of necessarily overtraining, but more the mental side of it of just, I don't like playing anymore. It's not fun for me anymore. Uh, it's too much, too many competitions, too much travel. I'm done with this. As an athletic director, you've been in the same place almost three decades. Have you gone through that experience? Are there times where you've kind of just, you know, experienced that that high levels of stress to the point where I don't want to do this anymore? Or oh, is it, a, yeah. how, do you, sure. how do you manage that to make sure that you don't walk away from it? I've learned to um, balance my mental and physical health with what, you know, needs to happen here at school. And I've, you know, I've given my permission, you know, given myself permission to walk away from this place. And it can be hard mm -hmm. when I can look out my kitchen window and see it all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, a, I have a, a principle that really supports, you know, what I do and the need to sometimes step away. So I, I think that's been really important for me is, I set boundaries. Uh, that's what I'm, you know, that's what I'm working for. So I've set boundaries where I don't look at my email after a certain time. My coaching staff knows that if it's a really an emergency, then you call me. Otherwise, it'll, I'll deal with it in the morning. And then on this flip side, I try to respect that as well. So last night, for example, I thought of something around eight o'clock and I wanted to tell my assistant athletic director. So I sent an email, but I scheduled it to go out at a.m. this morning. Because it didn't need to happen at that moment, but I knew if I didn't do it in that moment, I'd forget to do it. And so I sent it out at 8 a.m. this morning. So it's just, you know, coming up with tips and tricks like that. And then, like, when you do walk away, when you do step away, that you do, you do step away. You know, that your voice message or email message says, I'm on vacation or I'm unable to answer this phone call. And to know that that's okay to be unreachable at times. Mm, yeah, that's a very, a very valid point and good advice, I think, for, for any of us, whether we're coaches, professors, or, or athletic directors. Do you find as, as an athletic director, this, this kind of not necessarily stress, but busyness is seasonal? Is it, or is it all the time? I mean, you talked about looking at your school out the, the window and, and shutting down. How do you, is it seasonal or is it just constant? And every time, every week is different. It's funny because I would say it's seasonal, but then I also get to a point where I keep telling myself, oh, I just need to get to next week and things will slow down. And then the next week comes and they don't slow down. Um, so I, I would say one of the things I love about my job, but also can be the most frustrating is that every day is different. I can have my to-do list and it might take me a couple of days to get to even one of them because everything, every, the day just got away from me. It rained, it snowed. Where there's a kid in crisis, a coach needs me, you know, all these things will make every day different. And I do love that about this job, um, but it also can make it challenging. You have to like forgive yourself if you don't get that list done in exactly the way you wanted to do it or the time frame you wanted to do it. Thinking then just, just globally and whether this be for coaches or, or athletic directors, what advice would you give somebody who says, you know what, I want to, I want to go into coaching or I want to be an athletic director one day. You've been there and done it. What would you tell them? So uh, for coaching, start coaching at lower levels, you know, at your area, CYC or whatever, you know, is in your area. Start simple. Okay. So not with elite athletes, just start simple. Um, and those and, and, and then work your way up and get your coaching experience then. Like, you know, somebody graduated from um, 
who has a PE degree and um, they think that they can come and be an athletic director. And I was like, no, no, there's so much more. You, just because you were an athlete back in the day will not make you a good athletic director. So to remind people that there is a learning curve to this, a huge learning curve. Um, the National um, Interscholastic Athletic Administrators, Administrators Association, the NIAAA.org, they do a great job of providing certification for athletic directors. So I would definitely tell anybody interested in, in um, and being an athletic director to get certified. And this flip side with coaching, you know, get certified as well. So, you know, different um, sports have different certifications, different states have different certification programs. Get yourself certified in all those programs. Hmm. Well, Jen, thank you so much for, for joining us. And I appreciate your wisdom. If somebody watching this in future, whether it be on our podcast or, or YouTube, has a question for you that I wasn't able to ask, what's the best way for them to reach you? Easiest is Jen at jenbrooks.com. Uh, for those on the podcast, that's Jen, J-E-N at jenbrooks, J-E-N brooks.com. Jen, thank you so much for joining me. Appreciate you taking a few minutes out of your day. I know you have a busy schedule. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you.